You're most welcome to our next to the last um, seminar meeting of this semester. Um, we have one more, which is next Thursday, so I know that it's a difficult time this semester, but it's quite a bounty of riches we have here. Uh, just to mention now that the next one is on uh, Thursday, December 6th, coming up, is on the future of democracy. Um, topic uh, which is provocative and of interest to all of us. Um, so catch it before it departs, um, democracy that is. And it will be Philippe Schmitter um, of uh, Stanford University and the European University Institute, uh, who has some very interesting and concrete proposals for new directions. And from a very different perspective, uh, the commentator will be uh, Mike Menzer uh, from our very own Brooklyn College who will, that is more of a radical Democrat, and it will be an interesting interchange. Uh, today, we will have um, uh, just an, an exceptional wealth of uh, talk and, and ideas, because we are featuring now two uh, speakers uh, in a kind of mini-conference, and I'm just delighted to feature uh, two distinguished speakers here for us today. Uh, we're going to proceed um, with Sheila ben talk first, and we introduce her, and uh, with uh, an opportunity for about 15 minutes of questions specifically on her paper. Then we will take our usual five-minute break, and we will then have Ayala Chakar's paper, 15 minutes on that, and then hopefully there will be a little bit of time to discuss both of them in some way um, by way of questions. Uh, that will be followed by our usual magnificent reception on the fifth floor in the globalization lounge. Um, and you uh, don't want to miss that. So, um, I would like uh, just very briefly <coughs> to acknowledge um, uh, my co directors, uh, Richard Bowen is here, and Ruth O'Brien, and uh, Omar Dabour, and our fantastic assistant and videographer, John McMahon. Our postdoc fellow at Edison and our two um, very helpful um, RAs, uh, Flat and Val and Josh Keynes. So thanks to all of them. They do a fantastic job. Um, actually, we were uh, when we drafted this proposal, we were very much influenced by the thinking of both of our speakers today, in particular because they uh, speak very directly to the kinds of themes that we wanted to highlight in this overall seminar series on democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences. So I think they do so from interestingly synergistic perspectives, which you'll see. So it's particularly fortuitous that they're both here today. I'm really delighted. Uh, so Shayla ben Habib is well known to many of you, most of all of you. Um, she's the Eugene Meyer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale University, where she was also director of its program in ethics, politics, and economics for several years. And she previously taught at Harvard New School, Stony Brook, and BU. Uh, she was the recipient of the Ernst Bloch Prize in 2009 and the Leopold Lucas Prize from the University of Tulane in 2012 for her contributions to cultural understanding in a global world. And she holds honorary degrees from the universities of Utrecht, Valencia, and Rhode Island. Sorry. I know I did. Also as a recipient of a Guggenheim Award in 2011 and 12. Her, uh, her work has been translated into 12 languages, and she's the author of numerous books, just mentioning briefly, the Critique Norman Utopia, the study of the normative foundations of critical theory in 1986, Situating the Self, Gender, Community, and Postmodernism in Contemporary Ethics in 1992, which was the winner of the NEA's Best Book of the Year Award. Together with Drusilla Cornell, she edited Feminism as Critique in 1986. And with Judith Butler, Drusilla, and Nancy Fraser, Feminist Contentions and Philosophical Exchange in 1994. Uh, she's the author of The Reluctant Modernism of Hannah Arendt, 1996, reissued in 2002. Yes. This is amazing. Um, and The Claims of Culture, Equality and Diversity in Global Era, 2002. And The Rights of Others, Aliens, Citizens, and 
Residence 2004, which won the Ralph Bunch Award at Lake Abrapsa in 2005, and the North American Society of Social Philosophy Award in 2004. Getting to the end. Uh, another book uh, was more recent, uh, Another Cosmopolitanism, Hospitality, Sovereignty, and Democratic Liberations. And in 2012, she published a collection of her essays called Dignity in Adversity, Human Rights in Troubled Times, which you can get from Colleton Press. Uh, she's co-edited a number of books and recently served, uh, most recently as a fellow at the Strauss Center for the Study of Law and Justice at NYU. So, Shayla's talk is entitled Transnational Legal Spheres and the Construction of Cultural Difference. Welcome, Shayla. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for this kind of lengthy introduction. Is the voice okay? Yes. Yeah, this has been a terrific uh, series, some of which I had the pleasure of attending, so thanks uh, to you and your colleagues. And the Graduate Center at CUNY for organizing this. Uh, the background material that was distributed for this lecture are the introduction and chapter nine of my new book, Dignity and Adversity. But I have uh, prepared a new lecture where I'm pushing myself uh, to think uh, beyond some of the material I submitted in that, those chapters. And actually, I want to think about some of these issues uh, with you. I'm going to read because we are under time pressure and I want to try and keep to my 40 minutes, which I can if I stick my nose to the page as opposed to speaking freely, which will take longer, but I'll try. I wish to begin today with some general reflections on the changing place of legal studies within the critical theory of society. For some time now, scholars in the tradition of critical theory of the Frankfurt School, such as Halka Bunkrost, Bill Scheuermann, Jim Cohen, more distantly Frank Michaelman, and of course Jürgen Habermas himself, have engaged with legal doctrine and theory in unprecedented fashion. Of course, within the critical theory tradition, one cannot ignore the work of Franz Neumann, the author of Behemoth, one of the most influential attempts to diagnose the theory and practice of law under national socialism. Nor can one neglect among the first generation of scholars the work of Otto Kirchheimer, a student of Karl Schmidt, from whom Schmidt is said to have learned a great deal, and who wrote on the changing nature of law and political compromise in Europe in the 1930s. Nevertheless, I do not believe that it would be too controversial to say that legal doctrine and theory were hardly at the center of major works by Max Horkheimer, Theodor Adorno, and Herbert Marcuse, including the much interpreted, but in my view, wholly confused essay by Walter Benjamin on the critique of violence. And uh, Susan will probably contradict those. The critical theory of the Frankfurt School in this respect continued the reductionist discourse concerning the law that was prevalent in the Marxist tradition. Beginning with Marx's own reflections on the commodity form in the Grinderson capital and even in his earlier essay on the Jewish question, the Marxian tradition has long reduced legal norms to the expressions of property and exchange relations in the market. In the mid-1970s, this Marxist analysis of the law was much enriched through Michel Foucault's famous elucidation of governmentality as a unique and new form of social control that was made possible both by the market society and the administrative institutions of the modern state. Thus, in much critical theory, whether of the Frankfurt School variant or the Foucauldian type, legal doctrine and practice were seen as instruments of social control or as reflecting forms of domination in a capitalist society. There was no serious engagement with jurisprudence or legal doctrine. All this has changed quite radically. Without going into the reasons for the historically changing role of law within critical theory, which would be a lecture in itself, I think, let me assert that legal doctrine and practice have themselves become radically central to contemporary social transformations in two respects. First, law has emerged as a crucial medium of negotiation between facticity and validity in Habermas's terms and in the construction and evaluation of all forms of so-called difference, be they ethnic, religious, linguistic, national, sexual, in our pluricultural and post-secular democracies. Second, and even more surprisingly, 
legal doctrine and theory now seem to act as the utopian repository for conceptualizing the emergent shape of a new world, giving rise to what I will call the conundrum of legal utopianism and democratic skepticism. So let me begin with the first point. Law as a medium of negotiation of differences in pluricultural and post-secular democracies, which more closely tracks the material that the group uh, has been reading. In the contemporary world, we are witnessing the growth of religious fundamentalisms and the intense challenges they pose to one crucial aspect of the modern modernization process of <coughs> That is, the separation between religion and politics, contested as it always was, between theological truths and political certitudes. The ever fragile walls of demarcation between religion and the public square have become increasingly porous. Women's bodies in particular have become the site of symbolic confrontations between a re-essentialized understanding of religious and cultural difference and the forces of state power, whether in their civic republican, liberal democratic, or multiculturalist forms. A principal reason for the emergence of these public debates with their constantly shifting terms is a sociological one which I have characterized as reverse globalization. The distinction between the cultural and the religious, and this is not at all obvious, as well as the identification of customs, actions, and practices as being either religious or cultural, is occurring today against the background of the history of colonialism and the West's encounter with the so-called West. Whereas at one time, it was the historical experience of Western colonialism in facing its cultural and religious others that forced European political thought to clarify and solidify the line between the religious and the cultural. For example, the debate about widow burning in India that I'm not going to go into. This is well known in the literature. Today, it is mass migration from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East to the shores of the resource-rich liberal democracies such as the EU, the USA, Canada, and Australia, which is leading to the reframing of the distinction between the cultural, the religious, as opposed to the political. With worldwide streams of migration, a destabilization of identities and traditions is taking place, and tradition, in Eric Hobsbawm's words, is being reinvented. Certainly, among the best known of contemporary controversies, uh, which challenge liberal democratic assumptions in pluralist societies in the last three decades, has been the so-called Scarf Affair, L'Affaire de Foulard, La Voile in French, the Kopftuch Affair, or the Schleier Affair in German, and Turban Meselesse in Turkish. As uh, many participants in this uh, series know, the general term hijab in Arabic refers to a variety of head coverings ranging from the headscarf, referred to as basharat in Turkish, the turban, the bilbab, the chator, and the gorga. The bilbab is what covers the face and only leaves the eyes uh, uh, free. The politics of the scarf has become a transnationalist term, revealing complex moves and counter moves among ethnocultural and religious groups who mobilize around the symbolic markings of the female body challenging the sovereignty of the secular state and leading to difficult legal and in some cases constitutional negotiations. <coughs> now from all the three countries which I have considered in uh, chapter 9 uh, called political theology, namely France, Germany and Turkey, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights, which I will refer to, to which France, Germany, as well as Turkey are a party, provide the discursive frame of legal reference. Both the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights use Article 18 of the UDHR as the template. Article 18 reads, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes the freedom to change his religion or belief and the freedom either alone or in community with others in public and private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance, and the world. Now, I will not repeat here the detailed narrative about these controversies uh, I've outlined, 
I just want to call your attention to a few uh, points, and then I will discuss a case which I have not addressed so far, the Leila Shahin case uh, in Turkey. Now, note that the affair <coughs> on the in France between 1989 and 1996 and concerned primarily young school girls in French public schools. Subsequent iterations involved bans in France against wearing the burqa while driving and in public workplaces. In Germany, by contrast, the ban against their kopftu uh, concerned the school teacher, most famously the Ferashta Luden, who is an Afghani German uh, citizen, and not the students themselves. In 2003, the German Constitutional Court found it difficult to rule on constitutional grounds alone on the Farash Dalwudin case, who was dismissed from her job as a history teacher, and asked the various federal uh, lender, the various federal states in Germany, to resolve the question as to what the proper attire ought to be for a public school teacher. With the exception of Berlin, Seven of the German Bundesländer passed legislation banning the headscarf in the case of school teachers, but more or less exempted Christian and Jewish symbols from their reach, thus raising the whole question again of Islam is exceptionalism and neutrality. The Turkish case I've considered, again in the material that was distributed, is the ruling by the Turkish Constitutional Court in June 2008 to overturn the law passed by the AKP, Adalet and Kalkuma Parties, the other who is Justice and Development Party, thank you, um, with the, the National Assembly controlled by the AKP in February of that year, uh, decided to overrule the ban that forbade the wearing of headscarves and turbans, it now notice again, in institutions of higher learning. So what we see in these three cases, and this is what I want to emphasize, is that in the French case, we're talking about uh, schoolgirls. In the German case, we're talking about a, a, a teacher. And in the Turkish case, we're talking about uh, girls and, uh, in the universities. And now, note the way in which the target group that the law is addressing uh, is changing and ask yourselves then, so what exactly is going on? What is the degree to which this is a religious slash cultural slash uh, political issue. Now, I want to refer and consider uh, to discuss here in some detail a case I have not discussed in previous work and a very interesting <coughs> comment on my work by William Paul Simon in a good book called Human Rights Law and the Marginalized Other has taken <coughs> this Leila Shine case and is drawing very different consequences from it that I will draw, so I want to go back to, to this case. Now, given Turkey's membership in the Council of Europe to be distinguished from the European Union, and its adherence to the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, which falls under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, on November 10, 2005, the ECHR ruled in the well-known case of Leyla Shahin versus Turkey, Again, you may get confused by the terminology. The European Convention of Human Rights has 47 members. It is adjudicated by the European Court of Human Rights. It includes Turkey as well as Russia. The European Union is adjudicated by the European Court of Justice. And now I'm referring to a case that goes to the European Court of Human Rights in virtue of Turkey's membership in the European uh, Convention. Uh, this judgment, the so-called Leyla Shahin versus Turkey, was a major statement by the court on issues surrounding the wearing of the hijab, not only in Turkey, but throughout the member states of the Council of Europe. And it best exemplifies what I'm calling the construction of difference through the emergence of transnational legal spheres. Leyla Shahin and her attorneys launched a case with the European Commission on Human Rights against the Republic of Turkey, for forbidding her from pursuing her university studies before she wore the hijab. They claimed that Turkey had thereby violated her rights and freedoms Article 8, 9, 10, and 14, and under Article 12, Protocol 1. You have the handout here just if you want to refer to these articles. 
on June 29, 2004, the Chamber uh, ruled that there had been no violation of Article 9 of the Convention, which protects freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, again based on Article 18 of the UDHR. And the Chamber further ruled that no separate questions arose under Articles 8, 10, 14, and Article 2. Articles 8 and 10 concern the right to respect private and family life and freedom of expression, while Article 14 concerns the prohibition of discrimination and Article 2 concerns the right to life. Upon appeal by the applicant on September 27, 2004, the case was then referred to the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights and was accepted. Now the facts of the case then are as follows. Leila Shine was born in 1973 and had lived in Vienna since 1999 because she had decided to pursue her medical studies in Vienna University instead of Turkey. In 1997, as a fifth year student at the Faculty of Medicine at Bursa University, she had then enrolled at the Jayakosha School of Medicine in Istanbul. In the spring of 1998, in accordance with the circular of the Vice Chancellor of Istanbul University, which forbade the wearing of the hijab on the part of women and of having beards on the part of male students, she was denied access to the examination of oncology, to attend lectures in neurology, and other exams and classes. When she requested to the Istanbul Administrative Court that this circular be set aside because it violated her rights under the Turkish Constitution, the Administrative Court in Istanbul affirmed the prerogative of the Vice Chancellor to pass such a regulation in order to maintain public order and deny her appeal. The Grand Chamber of the ECHR found that while Istanbul University regulations restricting the wearing of the Islamic headscarf and measures taken thereupon had interfered with the applicant's right to manifest their religion, it also held that such interference was prescribed by law and pursued one of the aims set in Article 9 of the Convention, which says, freedom to manifest one's religion or belief shall be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and as are necessary in a democratic society in the interest of public safety, for the protection of public order, health or morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. Now, without going into all the decisions concerning the ruling of the court about Articles 8, 10, 2, and 4, which gets a bit technical, uh, let me uh, state what else was involved in this decision and then start drawing some of the theoretical conclusions uh, from it. The decision contained a survey of most laws and regulations about the wearing of the hijab in 47 member countries of the Council of Europe it came to the conclusion that there is no established standard across the 47 member countries in this regard. In evaluating the actions of the Republic of Turkey, the court invoked the now famous criterion of margin of appreciation, term that you may have encountered, which takes into consideration the member countries' arguments about what they consider Necessary to be necessary for the maintaining of quote, public safety, the protection of public order, health or morals, and for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. The court uh, simply assumed that pluralism, tolerance, and broad-mindedness are hallmarks of a democratic <coughs> society, and stated in no uncertain terms that women wearing the Muslim hijab in institutions of higher learning would be contradicting these values. It furthermore is asserted that wearing the hijab would affect the rights of Turkey's non-practicing Muslims as well as other minorities, but said very little about how this would be the case. And furthermore, as you would not be surprised, the court asserted that the wearing of the hijab was difficult to reconcile with gender equality, a decision that then gets taken up by the French Stasi court or is, you know, is, circulates in the European public sphere. Now, I think it would be foolish to deny the concerns about the place of toleration for non-Muslims, be it Christian or Jewish or Alevite minorities, sometimes not considered uh, Muslim enough, within the context of traditional Islamic thought as well as of Islamist political ideology, 
What is remarkable in the assertions of the court are uh, its paternalism, unclarified political assumptions, and views about Islam and gender equality in general. And these are exactly the issues that led the one judge, Judge Tilkens, to her dissent. I'm going to quote her. She writes, the first concerns the argument the majority uses to justify with the, the width of the margin, the margin of appreciation, namely the diversity of practice between states on the issue of regulating the wearing of religious symbols in educational institutions, thus the lack of a European consensus in this sphere. The comparative law materials, she writes, do not allow this conclusion as in none of the member states has the ban on the wearing of religious symbols extended to university education, which is intended for young adults who are less amenable to pressure. In other words, the ECHR's margin of appreciation doctrine harbors paternalism and now treats universities <coughs> and university institutions in the veritable Foucauldian sense. With regards to secularism, Judge Turkens argues that the court misinterprets Article 9 of the Convention because the Shahin case is concerned not with the freedom to have a religion, internal conviction, but to manifest one's religion, the expression <coughs> of that conviction. And finally, uh, she takes aim at the political assumptions guiding the court's decision. I quote, while everyone agrees on the need to prevent radical Islamism, a serious objection may nevertheless be made to such reasoning. Merely the wearing of the headscarf cannot be association with fundamentalism. Not all women who wear the headscarf are fundamentalists, she writes. Finally, she asks, what in fact is the connection between the ban on wearing the headscarf and sexual equality? The judgment does not say. And very important line, what is lacking in this debate, she writes, is the opinion of women both of those who wear the headscarf and of those who choose not. Now, many of you know, Judge Tulkan's statements in this case have now by now become you know, commonplace among feminist criticisms um, of uh, this issue you know, concerning the, uh, the scarf. But what's interesting is that this discussion now uh, is in the public sphere uh, in a court that has uh, basically jurisdiction over 47 different countries that are members uh, to it. Clearly, in all cases discussed, the headscarf is not simply a religious item of clothing, uh, seen as expressing a subjective choice and attitude towards the faith on the part of those who wear it, but it is seen by the states as a political symbol requiring careful state regulation and monitoring. Yet the transnational legal sphere and the dialogue across borders destabilizes the national alliances and boundaries among the various national authorities. Just as the judges of the Turkish Constitutional Court consider it necessary to uphold the ban on the wearing of the headscarves in universities for the sake of maintaining secularism and public order, judges of the German Constitutional Court, members of the French Stasi Commission, and judges of the ECHR concur with them. That in Turkey, France, and Germany, and in many other countries, as well as on the bench of the ECHR, there are those who see such a high-handed defense of secularism as violating human rights to freedom of religious expression, the principles of pluralism and tolerance for the rights of different others in a democratic society. In other words, there are no clear demarcations of the outside from the outside here of those, the others versus us, or they versus we, or Europeans versus Turks. The conversation is a transnational one, as well as a translegal one, and if I had had the time, there is a fascinating case from the Egyptian Supreme Court on May 18, 1996, which permits the wearing of the hedge carved at the turban, but bans the niqab, the form of covering that leaves the eyes, only the eyes uncovered. So the Egyptian Constitutional Court is also, you know, in the, in the uh, action. Now, I, I've argued in the past that through such controversies and confrontations, the dialectic of rights and identities are mobilized in processes I have called democratic iterations. Rights and other principles of the liberal democratic state need to be challenged and re-articulated in the public sphere in order to retain and enrich their original meaning. 
It is only when new groups claim that they belong within the circle of addressees of a right from which they have been excluded in its articulation that we come to understand the fundamental limitedness of every rights claim within particular constitutional traditions, as well as their context transcending validity that leads to principles such as equality, toleration, democracy, and pluralism. The democratic dialogue and the legal hermeneutic one are enhanced through the repositioning and re-articulation of rights in the public spheres of liberal democracies. The law sometimes can guide this process in that legal reform may run ahead of popular <coughs> consciousness and may raise popular consciousness to the level of fundamental rights and the Constitution, but the law may also lag behind popular consciousness and may need to be product along to adjust itself to it. In a vibrant, liberal and multicultural democracy, cultural political conflict and learning through conflict should not be stifled through legal maneuvers. Sterile, legalistic, or populistic jurispathic democratic iterations may also occur, a point that Bonnie Honig always criticized me for, but I think she misunderstands what I have in mind here. In some cases, no normative learning may take place, but only a strategic bargaining among the parties may result. In other cases, the political process may simply run into the sandbags of legalism, or the majority of the demos may trample upon the rights of the minority in the name of some totalizing discourse of war and fear. Violence may ensue. Democratic iterations do not advocate political teleology or theodicy. Rather, they permit us to conceptualize those moments when a space emerges in the public sphere and when principles and norms which undergird democratic will formation become permeable and fluid enough to absorb new semantic contexts, which in turn enable the augmentation of the meaning of rights. How am I doing on time? Good. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, it's going to be a job. Twelve. All right. <laughs> Let me now turn to what I identified at the beginning as the second dimension of the changing function of law in contemporary societies. Can the law be the repository of utopian transformations? Because what we saw about was the disciplining function of law really. Now, it's not widely accepted that <coughs> since the UDHR of 48, we have entered a phase, in a phase in the evolution of global civil society, which is usually characterized as a transition from <coughs> international to cosmopolitan norms of justice. While norms of international law emerge either through what is recognized as customary international law or through treaty obligations, cosmopolitan <coughs> norms accrue to individuals considered as moral and legal persons in a worldwide civil society. By cosmopolitanism, I have in mind both a moral and a legal proposition. Morally, the cosmopolitan tradition is committed to viewing each individual as a legal person entitled to the protection of their human rights in virtue of their moral personality and not on account of their citizenship or other membership uh, status. Now, as we see in the Leila Shahin case, uh, Leila Shahin can plead in front of the ECHR that her fundamental human rights as a citizen of a country that is signatory to the European Convention have been violated. This is the uniqueness of the many human rights covenants and of the cosmopolitan moment since World War II. Sovereign states too there undertake the self-limitation of their own prerogatives. This is not a post-state moment, but it is rather a limitation or transformation of state sovereignty. But the skeptic will ask, what does all this really mean? What possible significance can these multilateral human rights covenants and developments have if states continuously and brazenly violate them, manipulate them to their own ends, are they not merely words at worst or aspirational ideals at best that have little traction really in limiting or influencing state conduct? So France and Germany proceed with their own banning of the uh, head star. Do these developments that create a novel, enforceable, and justiciable legal order and at a more technical level, doesn't the formulate the process of formulating rights, reservations, understandings, and declarations, take the bite out of human rights treaties and make them merely convenient smoke screens for states uh, to uh, fight? 
Now, while skeptical doubts about state behavior and an international system that remains beset by violence, civil wars, and proxy wars, not to say the so-called war and terror, cannot be set aside, I remain convinced that something has changed profoundly in the grammar and syntax of the language of international law, sovereignty, and human rights. Um, abbreviating uh, a bit uh, uh, here for the sake of time. Um, surveying the legal writings of the last two decades on constitutionalization with or without the state, global constitutionalism, legal pluralism, etc., I have the impression that law and legal scholarship today, much as they help consolidate the interstate gains of the Westphalian Peace Treaty of 1648, by providing the philosophical and jurisprudential basis of liberal bourgeois revolutions in the 18th century, are anticipating a world that is yet to be born, in Jean Coyne's good phrase, in verite affair. Legal scholarship has become a constitutive element of a world that is yet to come, but we as contemporaries can only grasp with the help of various uh, metaphors. But what about this moment of cosmopolitan legal utopianism and democratic skepticism. Recall here the famous and influential article by my colleague Robert Dahl, can international organizations be democratic? And his resounding answer, no. Uh, I think that Dahl is wrong in this respect. And uh, again, abbreviating or rushing a bit at the end of my paper, as we have seen in the case of decisions concerning the Scarf Affair, Today, democratic will and opinion formation about epistemic limits and cultural diversity is taking place in the contemporary world in and through the medium of transnational legal spheres. National legislatures and the judiciary are continuously looking over their shoulders, so to speak, comparing notes, interpretations, and judgments about many cases. The decision of the Turkish AKP to pass legislation to lift the ban on the wearing of headscarves in Turkish universities was unquestionably a reaction to the disappointment in 2005 that many of their constituencies experienced with the decision of the ECHR. They had expected the ECHR to protect Europe, to wear, to vote in favor of Leila Shahin. The struggle then shifted from the legal back to the political sphere in a total movement back and forth, which is quite characteristic of this uh, controversy. Thus, while the global constitutionalism of many legal utopians may strike us as being too fanciful, it is also clear that the democratic skepticism of Robert Dahl and others cannot do justice to the transnational public and legal spheres at work in our world. But my point is not merely a sociological one. In the concluding <coughs> section, therefore, I want to try to show how we can understand democratic iterations as mediating dilemmas of post-secularism as they are situated between legal utopianism or the cosmopolitan moment and democratic skepticism. Through democratic iterations, uh, citizens and stakeholders reinterpret and reappropriate human rights principles such as to give them shape as constitutional rights and if and when necessary, suffuse constitutional rights with more content. Nor is it to be precluded that such constitutional iterations may themselves provide feedback loops in rendering more precise the intent and language of international human rights and declarations. As Judith Resnick, with whom I've collaborated and from whom I've learned a great deal on these issues, has observed, treaty ratification processes now no longer center upon, quote, a singular formal moment of ratification through a monovocal nation state. Uh, Resnick emphasizes that increasingly cities, states, counties, municipalities are themselves incorporating major human rights treaties even when the nation state may themselves be rejected. Thus, the city of San Francisco, as well as Sao Paulo, Brazil, have accepted CEDA, though we have not ratified CEDA, as you know. Portland, Oregon, has incorporated the UDHR. These processes of legal seepage, as we call them, at sites below the centralized judicial authority of the state, testify to disaggregation processes of the national and the trans-legal 
conversation. Resnick's innovative contribution is to suggest that RUDs, the ruts themselves, can be viewed in analogy to doctrines such as margin of appreciation and legal pluralism. She cites, for example, how Bangladesh in 1997 withdrew reservations to CEDA, which was earlier based on the conflict between Sharia law and the convention. Jordan withdrew a similar objection to a woman's right to independent residence and the domicile other than that of her husband in 2009. Sex-based differences in the military led countries, had led countries such as Australia, Austria, Germany, New Zealand, Switzerland, and Thailand to place reservations on SIDA, but many have since withdrawn their uh, caveats. In other words, even treaty ratification processes and the exceptions that states place on them need not be seen as affairs that take place once and for all, but need to be understood as a kind of pull and push kind of conversation uh, with many uh, uh, sort of negotiations. Democratic iterations thus occur throughout transnational civil society and global <coughs> spheres in diverse sites. In constitutional democracies, the courts are the primary authoritative sites of norm iteration through judicial interpretation. But the interaction between domestic and binding transnational norms can also take place through the contributions of organizations such as NGOs, INGOs, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, to the legal conversation that is unfolding. Now, the third site of iteration, besides the courts and the conversation between NGOs and INGOs and all, emerges through the interaction of judicial and transnational sources of law inter interpretation and the political opinion formation of ordinary citizens and residents. In formulating the concept of democratic iterations, it is this latter process that I have had most in mind, uh, though as you can see now that I'm beginning to extend this paradigm to cover more uh, the court's uh, actions as well and not just remain with social movements and the democratic uh, citizenry. Now philosophically, um, uh, many have asked me if democratic iterations are necessary for us to judge the legitimacy of a range of variation in the interpretation of the right claim, how can we assess whether democratic iterations have taken place rather than demagogic processes of manipulation or authoritarian intervention? Do not democratic iterations themselves presuppose some standards of rights to be properly evaluated? I argue that democratic legitimacy reaches back to principles of normative justification. Democratic iterations do not alter, in my view, the conditions of validity of moral discourses of justification that are established independently of them. Uh, very briefly, as you know here, it's the Habermasian model of discourse ethics, which uh, provides the normative justification uh, mode and uh, permits us to have a formal procedural criteria for being able to evaluate at the first blush. This is not enough, but I would say it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. And these are the principles of all those whose interests are affected by the adoption of a specific norm have the right to participate in discourses through which such norms are to be adopted. There is the condition of equal participation, equal say. Third is the challenge to rules of agenda setting. And fourth is the ability to engage in meta discourses. Uh, these conditions, and there is a lot of discussion we can have, some of which we've had when Reiner Force was here, about the interpretation of these formal conditions. But by and large, um, uh, again, they are necessary but not sufficient. They provide moral agents with what following Reiner Force or agreeing with him, I would call a veto. Uh, power. Okay. The prima facie, when four of these conditions are violated, whatever else may fall, then we can say that a democratic iteration has not taken place. Let me also finally observe that the hermeneutic model of iterations is recursive. And recursivity is an important principle. <coughs> there is 
an empirical and normative incompleteness to the interpretation of these rules that frame the discourses. There is equality, equal say, meta conversations, agenda participation. The recursive model of justification based on the force of iterations is related to many uh, discussions in contemporary non-foundationalist epistemology uh, that is, we are always already entering these discourses with some interpretations of the norms and the rights involved. And it is in the process itself, through recursive evaluation, that we come to some kind of clarification about them. Put more philosophically, this is not a foundationalist program. I would say it is a non-foundationalist epistemology based on the kind of project that Brandon is talking about, but maybe I'm not going too far ahead from the ECHR to Brandon and confusing everybody in the room. So let me conclude with three paragraphs and observation of Al Buchanan from his article, Human Rights and the Legitimacy of the International Legal Order. The more seriously, writes Buchanan, the international legal system takes the protection of human rights, and the more teeth our commitment has, the more problematic the lack of a credible public justification for human rights norms becomes. What then may be the epistemic virtues of institutions through which such norms are specified, contested, and revised over time? Given that human rights norms are necessarily abstract, they need contextualization and specification in all cases, by courts, by social movements, by NGOs. <coughs> but to avoid the parochialism of a free for all pluralism that may result from such contextualization, we need institutional processes that possess a certain epistemic quality. My argument is that the rules of this course ethics are the necessary but not sufficient conditions, um, at least minimal conditions, for judging such epistemic quality. And such epistemic quality is entailed in processes of public reasoning, where through a democratic public sphere and on deliberative sites in the judiciary, civil society, and political representative institutions, the democratic citizens interact uh, in a process of non-justification and reason uh, giving. Since the contextualization of human rights norms entails such processes of public practical reason, and since states can no longer simply hide behind the shield of sovereignty, the Turkish state couldn't get away with its decision, it had to be taken up to the ECHR, what we're looking at is a transnational conversation of practical reason that toggles back and forth between various concepts of human rights and their supporting arguments. Returning to the Leila Shahin case discussed above, this is my last paragraph, if we consider Judge Turkan's dissenting challenge to the court, we can see that she uncovers several unclarified assumptions concerning gender equality and headscarf, the autonomy of university students and the meaning of secularism, in liberal democracies, which other judges of the ECHR either take for granted or simply leave unexplained. The authority of good reasons exercised by the ECHR is here upended by the power of better reasons voiced by the dissent. And neither are Judge Turkan's arguments confined to the ECHR case alone. They can be extended and are extended by democratic citizens and stakeholders whether or not they are familiar with her specific formulations to the public arena of debate in their own societies. In conclusion then, the law's facticity, law's constraining power, must always be mediated through its validity by its being subjected to the test of good reasons. Thank you for listening.
working. Um, so, sometimes I have a story question. Um, <coughs> so, it's, you know, I take it that you see Article 9 or Article 9 18 in the EPHR university defining norm. But you also think that these university defining norms are in specification and and it doesn't range from kind of possible implications of what you take, and that's a good thing because it allows for the kind of integration to the software. Like um, but of course, there's a limit to the range of possible implications. So, my question, to my sense, is that you feel that the Head Start, uh, and I can share this, and I may be wrong about this, is a kind of incompatible <coughs> with uh, Article. That would be my interpretation. As that seems to be the interpretation that you favor. Uh, so my question really is whether you think that the head scarf band uh, in, in France is incompatible with all possible interpretations, let's say, of Article 9 and Article 18, or whether it's just incompatible with some uh, interpretations, which include the so it's really about the strength of your uh, conviction of justice. Yeah. Is it totally unreasonable, incompatible with all of our interpretations, or is it subject to reasonable disagreement or something you know, that kind of friends and Germany have to work out and how to work together? That's a great question, uh, Adam. It's uh, um, I think that what there can be a reasonable disagreement about is uh, not the particular article of the content itself. Um, I think we should, you know, really uh, consider uh, all the various interpretations there are involved and. Um, I would say that there is so much evidence to see that there is the empirical part that, that this act actually is uh, a very difficult act on the part of uh, the women and the girls involved. There is a the question about um, so called pressure, family pressure. Sometimes this is formulated in Turkey as pressure from the village, period of us, and so on. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I uh, think that the uh, first uh, premise uh, that I would put out is to see this uh, as an act of religious expression rather than exercise suspicion continuously that this is really about something else and we, the state, are, are going to figure out what it is about. It is difficult if you also believe in women's rights, you know, and one shouldn't ignore, of course, you know, moments of lack of autonomy, pressure, and so on. But you are asking me, what is the margin of reasonable disagreement? And I am saying that it seems to me that reasonable disagreement has so far been invoked rather inconsistently as some kind of, you know, disciplinary measure by the states involved often based on um, uh, prejudice and often based on a kind of you know, pushback against uh, a religious movement. Now, uh, you could push back and say, well, is reasonable disagreement that results here, um, in, in what sense is it related to uh, your understanding of democratic iterations? Well, there is one way in which it is related. And that is, uh, we don't know very often in these cases what the women and the girls are saying. In the Leila Shahin case, she insists again and again that she's a secularist. So it's a great question. I'm, I'm sort of taking a bite at the, at the edges. Please also indicate your, your name. No way, not at all. Yeah, I just want to say this is also a clarification. Is this really 
No, you have to speak up. They okay. Have to speak up. Um, I guess at the very end when you go over your necessary but not sufficient model, and I guess I'm just questioning, so are you saying an actual dialogue has to follow these four conditions? Or is it a sort of hypothetical um, status, you know, faction that is necessary? We can always invoke these criteria counterfactually to criticize existing processes of dialogue and conversation. Whether any particular dialogue ever fulfills them, no, because they are always open to interpretation. And they are always more or less good enough. But so they're sort of a negative critical That's role. Right. But what if, can you reach, and this is coming from another tradition, can't you reach a, a good decision that uh, wouldn't necessarily uh, satisfy them. I mean, I guess I'm wondering whether they're really necessary to read it, to reach. And maybe that goes back to the, the first question. There are other models of public reason, and I was just wondering. If, I mean, I think that yeah. they're actually fairly obvious, and I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know how to get you know how to get going. I mean, you know, this is I don't know how to reason normatively if we do not know, you know commit ourselves to some understanding of equality to some understanding of people say, to some capacity for critical reflexivity and for challenging the rules of the dialogue. I mean, these seem to me to be certainly not enough, but if you have a fallibilist conception of, you know, reason the way I do, the whole thing, the whole work is in the interpretation and elaboration of these norms, but I, I you know, I just find it wrong that one keeps wanting to knock them out of order. Right? Because I think that um, uh, without these norms, which we always, in some fashion, presuppose, we, we cannot really exercise normative you know, critique. We can try to make everything imminent. Right? Well, but these norms are imminent in the liberal discourse of democratic societies, but they can't just be justified on that basis alone. I mean, we know the terms of this. Uh, of this uh, of this discussion, but well, you, uh, you can answer my question <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Whether I'm convinced, <laughs> Whether I'm convinced <laughs> because there's a whole Hi, my David. I'm grad student here. Um, my question is also about these norms. Um, as you mentioned, you brought different interpretations of them. For that reason, if we're going to use them to criticize practices, we use them as a base for practices. It seems first we need some kind of agreement to how to interpret them, but you know, how do we reach that agreement if we need them to have a debate in the first place, how do we debate about it? Right, the, first, the question of uh, infinite uh, recess. I hope I have a, an answer to that that was the answer provided with Gadamer. I really don't have a better answer, and I'm not trying to beg out, you know, from difficult philosophical questions here. I think we are situated in hermeneutic traditions of interpretation and conception where we always already have some understanding of equality and fairness and critical reflexivity. But we, we never just begin uh, from nothing. This does not mean that we take these for granted. The whole philosophical work is uh, how we interpret and reinterpret these norms that are uh, part of the public vocabulary and discourse of our societies, right? I mean, these norms, these human rights norms that I invoke, right, are, have themselves become part of the behavior of state. They are part of international law. It is what states subscribe to. So they are normatively present in our world, right? It, as Habermas would say, it is always facticity and validity, right? But we then have to enter the process of interpretation and conversation. We don't begin. Uh, we don't begin uh, from uh, scratch. I think the difficulty of this project, and here I'm coming back to Adam, because you know, I mean, I think as philosophers, we have to be honest about what we are doing. Is the margin? I don't like the ECHR margins of appreciation doctrine, but you know, besides the formalist procedural answer, I don't have other stronger criteria to also be able to say necessary and also insufficient. Uh, the next person I saw was Elvira Asselich. Hi, uh, my name is Elvira Asselich, uh, philosophy department here. I also have a question. Um, 
Thank you. 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 Thank you
there are uh, uh, going on. There is no, there is no question uh, about the fact that, of course, uh, power is a factor here, and in fact, the RKP has succeeded uh, in now uh, stuffing the Turkish constitutional court, which was very biased in a move that Morsa didn't succeed, in, <laughs> but the Turks succeeded in the Turk Erdogan succeeded in before. So uh, uh, power is part of this dynamic, but uh, what I think is important is that <coughs> to see that it isn't either or, or that because power is involved, that what the cards are doing is only speaking as not pieces of power. Right? That's what I'm resisting. And of course, I mean, you see uh, uh, you know, the graph, but on the other hand, um, to reduce the rights of the women or the right of the president of the Turkish Republic, who finally can you know, discard for whatever reason, right? To just the power grab by the IKP, I think that is the move that I'm resisting. So it's a matter of finding you know, the proper the proper linkages. And that's what I mean that um, the discourse about power has been wielded so reductionistically. And that's why we have been so skeptical about you know, the legal doctrine and practice, because we have said it is always about something else. It's either about class struggle or civilizational struggle or you know, the, the secularism as well. That's why we have not you know, taken it, uh, taken it uh, seriously enough. But um, now, if you, know, you bring power in, uh, to the picture also, of course, one of the issues is that all this is happening via women. Women's bodies. I mean, there are a lot of other issues about which nobody seems to be getting so hot under the collar. What about Islamic laws about uh, um, uh, interests and you know economic regulations? Right? Nobody seems to be talking about this. But so the very presence of women's bodies is also clearly part of this big sort of intercultural, intercivilizational conversation. And you know, I am its work also on the you know, uh, status of you know, Orthodox Jewish women and the politics in you know, her first book, Multiple Jurisdictions, shows very, very well this. So the second part of your question is about the US. Uh, I'm trying to understand this. I, I, you know, I, the US has a cosmopolitan tradition. It begins this way. Now, with the neoconservative, uh, attacks on a lot of things between which, you know, Justice Scalia. There is this debate within the U.S. court itself. I mean, I would love to know more about the U.S. tradition, but I am really examining it. I spent too much time talking, you know, thinking about the alien tort claims, you know, statute, and finally, I think I understand what that what that statute is about. Uh, I think it is a it, it is a struggle within the U.S. jurisprudence itself, but I would resist the argument that the U.S. is anti-cosmopolitan, uh, pure sovereignist, nationalist, does not believe in transnational dialogue. This is just not the case. There is always, I think, some kind of contentious dialogue within the court itself, and we will see now what they're going to rule in this famous Kyogo case versus Shell that is being, you know, that's brought under the alien tort claim statute. So, but there is, there is, you know, I'm agreeing with you again that there is little question that the hegemonic status of the U.S. has created a discourse of skepticism uh, towards international law, both on the right and the left, by the way. I mean, we know about Scalia, but we think less about the kind of the reductionist leftist missile also as well. And so my attempt is a little bit trying to say, come, let's bring this back into progressive discourse.
into um, unrelated to various institutional and empirical situations. And it seems to me that part of this normative plan analysis would be a lot more satisfying. Uh, if, I mean, you do talk about law, obviously, and, uh, international courts and regional courts and jurisdictions, that's a form of institutionalization. But I wonder if, if it's, and, and at one point you referred to the, the but again, this is kind of on the uh, normative plan as well, but the phenomenon of public reason and how that's important. Um, and, but there, there seems to be this hiatus between, uh, again, the normative plane and, and a more, the, the level of thinking description uh, whereby uh, reasons become fluid and there, there are really uh, exchanges that do kind of broaden uh, perspectives and, and worldviews. And I, I wonder if um, you, you care to go there a bit and talk a bit more about uh, you know how reason and, and uh, these kinds of exchanges can be institutionalized more on the ground, less in terms of uh, you know, uh, juridical institutions, where even the notion of what counts as legal reasoning can be highly restricted with evidence, etc. Um, I, I think that that um, this would kind of add a dimension to to the uh, scope here. That would, um, you know, make make it even even more compelling. Um, then here I, I hear two questions here. I uh, I couldn't agree with the last part of your statement uh, more. You know that this is also not just a matter of the courts. The reason why I in this paper I brought in the course on the democratic integration was so much centered on social movements that you know I was uh, asked. I think justifiably well non iteration in our complex societies takes place in at least three levels. The first are the courts, the second are the interaction between you know the courts and various national, transnational, international institutions that are there also as interpreting these you know human rights documents and conventions, right? The UN has various observer bodies, and then there are bodies like Amnesty International and Human Rights First that are also part of the conversation, although nobody appointed them. And then the final level is the way in which this comes into social movements and political life, and you know the public and the public sphere. And um, so I, I try to give you know this sort of threefold, uh, threefold back and forth. Um, but uh, I think that there are interesting uh, divergences among those of us who work still or claim to work within the traditional critical theory of the degree to which we want to become contextualist or non-contextualist. Okay. I sometimes find that, I think, you know, that um, I, 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 well, this is another conversation. I find, you know, Reiner becoming a bit too foundationalist and Axel becoming far too contextualist in this recent book on freedom. And it's a, it's a bit of a balancing act, but that is something that is like, you know, occupying behind all of us. So let me, let me just look there. Okay, well, um, we have a fantastic second paper. Uh, right now I'd like